um, how many how many kind of feel like it feels like Christmas? Any, anybody there yet, or you're still like, oh? I mean, anybody just love Christmas? Is it your favorite time of the year? Most, yeah, a lot of you, a lot of you. And and, and I'm not going to ask the show of hands for those of you who hate it. Uh, there actually are some people who do, do not like Christmas. It's like, oh, not again. Like, what's with the music and the malls and the decorating? And, and like, here we go again. Another story about the birth of Jesus. And, and it's always kind of challenging a little bit because how can you say the same story over and over but a different way? Like, like, and so, so sometimes it's challenging. And, and uh, you know, but for some people, it's not the most wonderful time of the year. And, uh, and you know, many of us, you know, when... Uh, I mean, you know, when you do something over and over and over again, it can actually lose its effectiveness. I don't know if you, you really understood that in life, but sometimes when you repeat something over and over, and let's be real, like, do we really care about the birth of Jesus, the story about Jesus' birth? I'm not going to ask you to put your hands up. Please, don't put your hands up. But so, sometimes we're like, we're more in love with the idea of Christmas than actually the birth of Jesus. And uh, do we really care? I mean, we like what surrounds Christmas, and it's not that we're not interested. It's not that we don't care, but it just seems so distant sometimes. It's just like, like, I wasn't there. Like, really, I'm not sure how. Like, like, and, and so some of us, it's tough to get motivated. We're, we're, we're like the old Ray Charles song, like the spirit of Christmas, right? And some of us, like, until we start feeling that feeling, we're like, well, it's not quite Christmas yet. I remember um, when Carlita and I first started dating. Uh, back in the 90s, um, we uh, we started dating, and uh, because I'm I'm from uh, from Newfoundland, um, I can't really bring her into my world and be a part of my friends, etc. I was living in Ontario, and so I would get invited to to her place, and we would hang out with. She had this really close uh, girlfriend, and 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 this friend had a boyfriend. And we're young, and we're hanging out, and going on double dates, and you know, going on day trips, and and I mean, it was, it, it's kind of interesting because because I, I'm I'm almost like um, you ever feel like you're like there's this guy from The Rock who who like and, and I mean, Newfoundland's a whole different world, kind of like Alberta, right? The two two different worlds are part of Canada, and uh, and I'm using, of course, mummering. Anybody know what mummering is? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, you know, it's crazy. Mummering is like. You, people would dress up in these costumes, you had no idea who they were, and they would just come into your home, and you, they would just entertain with you. You know, they, you have these strangers coming into your place, and uh, small town living, everybody kind of knows everybody, but you had no idea who's sitting in your chair. In the, and there would be the mummering song, and they would sing, and they would come for a bit, and then they would go on to the next house. I mean, you can't get away with that these days. I mean, you know what? You might have a bunch of stuff stolen out of your house. But, but mummering was, was like a very big part of Christmas in, uh, in Newfoundland. And so as Carlita and I continuing dating, I, I couldn't pull her into that world. I had to kind of fit into her world. And I got to know her friend. And I got to know her friend's boyfriend. And like I said, we would go on these day trips. And uh, I remember hanging out at the family homes. And, and, uh, and it always seemed to be like, like one thing missing. They, they had all these memories that I wasn't a part of. They would, they would go through photo albums, you know, I, was, I remember just getting so frustrated, like, like, they would be like, oh, look at that, oh, you look so funny back then, and not talking to me, because I'm not in the photo, it's just the three of them, and, and their friends, oh, you remember so-and-so, I wonder whatever happened to him, or like, oh, oh, you remember her, I can't believe she married him, what was she thinking, and, and so you, there's all these memories going on, and I'm like, can we just get on with it? Like, I, I, I just feel like I'm left out, and sometimes they would go through all this and laughing and having fun, and while they're taking their time enjoying their memories, I'm thinking, like, can we just, can we just get over this? I have nothing in common with your memories because I wasn't there. I wasn't there to be a part of them. And sometimes we almost have that same, without knowing it, same attitude when it comes to stories in the Bible. It's like we read them, but because we weren't there, it's like, can we just get on with it? Can we just move on from these things? I, I don't really get it. And if we're not careful, if we have that same attitude for many of us, because we weren't there, one of the greatest stories of all can kind of come and go, and we completely miss it. That's the birth of Jesus. It's because we weren't there. Many of us, when it comes to Christmas, I mean, we just, like, what's the big deal? And some of it, we, we, you know, it, it, we, it just loses its significance, and we find it hard to relate to. And, and so we're like, yeah, yeah, give me Christmas. I like it. 
I like the feeling of it. I like, like, like uh, don't forget the gifts. Don't forget the gifts. We've got to have gifts over Christmas, but let's just get on with it. What's really the importance of Christmas anyway? And so what? Jesus is born in a manger. What has that have to do with my life today? Like, I just wasn't there. I can't relate to it. I'm just not sure. And so Christmas actually, though, was a huge deal. It's massive. And if we're not careful, another year will come and go and we'll completely miss it. We, we will. We'll miss this opportunity. And while we've made it about gifts and festivities and decorations, and don't forget the turkey dinners, none of those things are wrong. And, but if, if, if that's our concept or idea of Christmas, we've missed it. And I don't want this to be another year to come and go for you. I hope all of us as a church begin to understand how significant and revolutionary, revolutionary and world-changing this season, the birth of Jesus, is. Sometimes I wonder, you know, um, maybe, maybe we don't get the significance of now because we don't understand how it started. Anybody, you have something similar in life? You know, you're like, I, I don't know. Like, it, it, sometimes it's good to go back in order to go ahead. And I, I thought this morning, you know, maybe we should do that. Maybe to help us understand the significance of now, let's go back and revisit the significance of then. And how it all started. I'm going to take you right back to the book of Genesis. Genesis chapter 1, verse 31. God saw that all that he had made saw that it was very good. And there was evening and there was morning on the sixth day. God thought, I mean, he created everything and everything was good. You remember Genesis 1 back then when it was all created? Anybody there? Anybody feel like you were there? You just, you, yeah, your body's, oh man. Genesis 1, a long time ago, long time ago. And, but, but back in the beginning of creation, God saw that it was good. God was pleased. He was pleased with his creation. He had just created the earth, the sky, snow even, yeah. Trees, mountains. I still haven't seen the beauty of the Rockies yet. Looking forward to doing that hopefully soon, but, but the water, the oceans, living creatures, man and woman, God created it all and said, this is good. This is good. And for a season, it was good. It was very good. It was perfect. The problem was Satan, we know one day is no longer going to be able to rule. He's going to be destroyed. But back in the beginning, Satan kind of inhabited the earth and, and began to infect humanity with sin. Back in the beginning, this perfection, this, this thing that God saw that was good was now tarnished because of sin. And I don't know how to realize, I mean, I'm sure there's all kinds of definitions of sin, but sin really is anything God disapproves of. If he doesn't approve of it, then, then we can pretty much chalk that up as sin. I want to encourage Maybe you here today and, and, and some of you watching online, and I'm going to go out on a limb a little bit. But if you want to know how to live, if you want to know if your life is pleasing to God, begin to see, okay, is what I approve of what, what God approves of? And you take God's word and you begin to use it as a mirror. And I get it. We live in a culture where we're, we're almost being forced to believe what culture says we should believe. And so there's some hot topics right now, right? Uh, gender identity, et cetera. And, and God created man and woman. And, and now the, that's being, you know, like forced in a sense that you can be whatever you want to be. And so, so we approve of certain things. And my, my thing is like, why don't you take the word of God and see if God approves of changing what he's created? Or, or things like hot topics like abortion or, or homosexuality and, and, and all the greed of us just wanting more and more. And more all those things, many of us, we, 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 we live in a society and a culture that says, no, no, you have to believe this way. But when you step back, you've got to ask yourself, okay, if I approve of these things, does God approve of them? And we begin to look at Scripture and see that a lot of these things that we've accepted is not approved by God. And so if it's not approved by God, then it's not right. It's sin. God doesn't okay it. Then we need to be understanding that God's word is first and what God thinks is, is priority. And so... It's not a matter of what Bill thinks. It's not a matter of what you think. Not a matter of what we think. Is what, what does he think? What does he say? What does he approve of? 
And so after God had created humanity, a lot, a lot happens in the next number of chapters. Sin runs rampant. Cain kills Abel, you know the story. And it just people are living a life that pleases them. Chaos is everywhere. And then there's a shift. The Bible says, Seth had a son and named him Enosh. And at that time, when all kinds of stuff was going on, as you know, this is back in the beginning, the Bible says at that time, people began to call on the name of the Lord. All of a sudden, people began to think, life has been crazy. Our world is falling apart. And they just started to connect the dots. It's because we've abandoned God. It's because we've tried to live life the way we wanted to live. And all of a sudden now we're in this mess. And the Bible says at that time when people began to understand, they turned back to the Lord. They began to call on the name of the Lord. And so instead of trying to solve their own problems, instead of trying to fix things, that was broken. They realized that God is the answer. God is who we need to fix this mess. And so you would think that they would go back to a perfect world, wouldn't you? But no, because Satan still was roaming. And Satan's objective is to kill, steal, and destroy every single one of you. And that was his intent back then. And so sin enters the picture again. And, and things were good until that happens. It devastates the world. Sin turns things upside down. And there were bad and evil things everywhere. People had turned from God, and now they're turning to evil. Genesis chapter uh, 6, I think it is, verse 5 says this. The Lord saw how great the wickedness of, human, of the human race had become on the earth, and that every inclination of the thoughts of the human heart was only evil all the time. Doesn't that sound familiar to us? Doesn't it sound like the day we live in? Like only evil all the time. And that's, that's the world that the Lord was a part of and he saw and he was grieved the bible says the lord regretted that he had made human beings on the earth and his heart was deeply troubled can you imagine the lord regretted or or other versions say he was grieved he was grieved because he had made humanity i mean i don't know if you know basically grief really is the price we pay for loving someone that's what grief is if we don't love them we don't grieve for them but if we love them, we grieve. And God loved his creation. He begins to grieve. The Bible says he regretted. He grieved. And he was deeply troubled. It's one thing to grieve for someone, but it's interesting that God who created everything is grieved and troubled because of his creation. I don't know. Maybe here's a question I want to throw your way. Has there ever been a time in our lives where maybe we've grieved God because of our actions, because of what we've taken on as, as a view or a, or a stance. Uh, have, we, have we grieved God in any way? Has your relationship or maybe lack of relationship ever grieved God? And so after this time, you know the story of Noah's Ark. God sends a flood in all this wickedness, evil, all the time. God sends this flood, and it wipes out humanity except for Noah's family. Noah's family is not wiped out. He saves Noah and his kids. you think that would solve the problem, but guess what? Sin shows up again. It's like it never goes away. You know, we see God creates heavens and the earth and humanity and sees that it's good and perfect, and sin tarnishes that. And then people turn and call on the name of the Lord. They get it, but then sin enters the picture again. The Lord wipes out everything except one family. And guess what? It was one that family that, were, that allowed sin to come into the picture again. And so Satan is real. I'm telling you. He exists and he wants us living ungodly, miserable lives. And so that's just a little picture of the Old Testament. There's so much more. But that's what it really is about. A group of people called the Israelites, God's chosen people, that continued to call on God in difficult times. And when God would answer their prayer, they would pull back from God. They would walk away from God. They would live their own life to please themselves. And then when things would get difficult, God would say, okay, I'm taking my, my hands off of you. You want to live whatever way you want to live, you do it. And then they would. And then all of a sudden things would get so bad, they would come back to God. We're so sorry. We're so sorry. And God would say, okay, I'll take you back. It's almost like this roller coaster relationship. And so there's a struggle between God and his people. And God loves them so much he calls them his own, and yet they keep turning away from God. They keep involving themselves 
in evil all the time. But God doesn't want to wipe them out anymore. He says, I'll never send the flood to wipe out humanity again. And so he says, this time, it's going to be different. Up to that point in history, people had shown their devotion to God by outward actions, right? You know the Old Testament way of getting God's attention. They would, they would sacrifice animals. And they would say, okay, God, we're so sorry. We are so sorry. We've turned our back on you again. This is the, this is the hundredth time now, God. Please, please, I want to show you that I want to make things right, so I'm going to sacrifice an animal on an altar to you so that God... You will forgive me of my sin. And so the relationship, the problem was, it was almost like an external relationship. It was like it was about outward things. Like, God, I want to prove to you I love you by killing something, by shedding its blood. And that's how they would express their love, not inwardly to God, but they would express it outwardly. And people would say things with their mouths, how much they love God, but their hearts were far from Him. So God said, I'm not interested in simple words. This time's going to be different. I'm interested in the lifestyle. I'm interested in the heart. It's almost like God was saying, enough with all the outward stuff. Enough with all the, all the, you know, just just these things that you do to try to get my attention. The things that you do to try to make things right. Like, I've had enough of it. I want things to change. I want it to be different. I, I need to have a relationship with the ones that I created. It needs to be more than about an outward thing. It needs to be more about saying the right things, looking the right way, going to the right places, you know. It needs to be more about just going to church and Christmas and Easter and all, you know, all those outward things that we try to do to please God. God's like, I need to have a relationship with my creation. This time is going to be different. And so God comes up with a plan. Not a new plan, but a plan that he had from the beginning. A goal to be with them. That's going to be different this time. I'm not going to wipe out humanity. I'm not going to destroy everything. But this time my plan is going to be different. I will go to my creation. I will go to be with them. Isaiah chapter 7, 14 says, Therefore the Lord himself will give you a sign. The virgin will conceive and give birth to a son and will call him Emmanuel. Do you know what Emmanuel means? God with us. He's like, this time is going to be different. And I'm going to prove it. I'm going to prove it. I mean, this is foreshadowing of the birth of Jesus, but it didn't happen when Jesus decides to show up. This was a plan that God had way before. I mean, this is prophetic. This is, this is in the book of Isaiah. This is like way before Jesus being born, but God had a plan, and it wasn't accidental. It wasn't like, oh, plan A, plan B didn't work. No, from the beginning, God knew this was going to happen. And he says, I'll take the first step. I'll show humanity how much I love them, not by words, but I'll give my best. I'll give myself. I'll give my son, Jesus. I'll send you my son because I want a relationship with you. You know it well. Let me read it to you. This is how the birth of Jesus, the Messiah, came about. His mother Mary was pledged to be married to Joseph, but before they came together, she was found to be pregnant through the Holy Spirit. And because Joseph, her son, was faithful to the law and yet did not want to expose her to public disgrace, he had in mind to divorce her quietly. And But after he had considered this, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream and said, Joseph, son of David... Do not be afraid to take Mary as your wife, because what's conceived in her is from the Holy Spirit. She will give birth to a son. You're going to give him the name Jesus, because he will save people from their sins. And all this took place to fulfill what the Lord had said through the prophet. And this is what he said, the virgin will conceive and give birth to a son, and they will call him Emmanuel, which means God with us God with us see Christmas is really the beginning of a new beginning and we don't kind of need to hear another story about you know the birth of Jesus and then just go about our regular schedules and our days and our things but I think it's a season for us to go okay hold on now 
all this time, I just thought it was another story that I really couldn't relate to because I wasn't there. But maybe this story is way more significant. Maybe the birth of Jesus is way more significant because now I understand how it all started. Now I understand that, that I was broken. And my life of sin is not pleasing God. And God took the very first step and said, okay, I want to restore this relationship. I want this relationship to be the way I created it to be. And so I'll take the first step. By God's grace, humanity wasn't wiped out again with a flood. But humanity would experience God's love by having a relationship with God through his son, Jesus Christ. Incredible. Incredible when you think about it. That's why the birth of Jesus is so important. That we can actually have a personal relationship with God. We can. Emmanuel, God with us. That's why Jesus is central in everything to Christianity. It's because God wanted to restore a relationship with you, with me. And he said, I'll prove it. I'll prove how much I love them. I'll send my son Jesus. See, if we don't understand the beginning, it's sometimes way more difficult to understand the rest of it, right? Often like to to tell people just about, I, I don't know, I almost see the whole picture as like five steps. You know, it's like, like Christmas is step one, the birth of Jesus. We're we going to understand, wow, he loves me that much that he wants to be in relationship with me. Like, who am I to deserve God giving everything? And that's what he did during Christmas. The birth of Jesus, he gave it all up. And then if there's another step, if there's a part two to this, it's, it's Good Friday. It's when Jesus comes, God gives himself, God with us, and then he's crucified. He had to experience death. He had to be that sacrifice that the Old Testament people were, were doing. He, they were sacrificing things, and Jesus said, okay, enough with the outward things. I'll be that sacrifice once and for all. Never again will you have to sacrifice because I'm not after the outward things. I'm not after sacrifice. I'm after obedience. I want your hearts. I want a relationship. And so he gives his life. Part two, Good Friday. Part three is kind of like Easter where God conquers death. He dies so that we can live. He gives his life. He conquers. He rises from the dead. And then part four is when he says, okay, now that I've finished everything that I need to do, I want you to go and take this message that I've left for you Go and make disciples. Be filled with the Holy Spirit. Don't try to do it without the Holy Spirit. And we'll talk about the Holy Spirit in, in January. We'll walk through the book of Acts and just explore the Holy Spirit, how he's needed. Because Jesus said, don't try to go without the power of the Holy Spirit. That's almost like part four. And how many know that's kind of where we're at right now. And part five is still to come, the return of Jesus Christ. When he comes and takes his bride. And so... He never said, okay, once you become a follower of my son, once you enter into that relationship, you go ahead and take it easy and sit back and do nothing for the kingdom. Just wait for me to come back and get you. That's not in the Bible. What is in the Bible when Jesus said, until I return for you, I've got a mission for you. I have a mandate. And you take this good news and you share it with those who don't have it. And that's what Christmas is all about, God with us. If you want a relationship with God, then we receive the gift of his son, Jesus. That's it. What point is a gift if you don't receive it? Can you imagine? Now, I wish I, if this thing's plugged in. If it wasn't plugged in, I'd pick it up. and I'd, Can you imagine if, if I came with a gift and I said, here you go. And you're like, nice gift. I'll just go give it to someone else. It's not, it, it, that, and, and that can't be our response to the birth of Jesus. He, God has given us himself a gift, and it's up to us to receive that gift, God with us. There's no plan B. I don't care. I don't, I don't care what Oprah says. I don't care what the New York bestseller says. Everybody has their opinion. Well, well no matter what religion you're a part of, it, uh, in the end, it all works out anyway. That is not true. There is only one way, and it's Jesus Christ. One way. Not plan B, plan C, plan D. There is one way, and his name is Jesus and the only way for you and I to inherit eternal life is when we accept this gift of Jesus. Christ, Christmas is about accepting God's gift. 
his son. And so the question today as we conclude our time together, as we begin to reflect on the birth of Jesus and we begin to own it in a sense, I guess my question to each one of us today is, have you fully received him? Have you really opened your heart? Is your experience with Jesus more of a formality? Is, is it more of just, I'm just a little too busy right now. I'll kind of, I'll see you next week, God. Or maybe is your understanding like, wow, I get it. I understand God wanted a relationship with me. And he did it in a different way. He sent himself. He sent his son, Jesus. And I don't know how it all works. I can't figure it out. That's, that's mind-blowing. That God would come to us by way of his son, Jesus, who is God, but yet his son. Wrap your mind around that for a moment. But our question today, if you're here in this room or watching online, is have you fully opened yourself to the gift of Jesus? Obviously, he's more than a gift. I don't want to minimize him to some package wrapped up. But God sent Jesus for us. And if we just simply just put him on a shelf or pack him away somewhere in our lives, we've missed out on the whole thing. And I don't want this year to come and go, this Christmas season, where we miss it. And let's have fun blessing one another and, and giving hats and gloves and boots to the kids and, and going to parties and having our good turkey dinners or whatever dinners you have. I mean, those things are amazing. God's called us to be hospitable and spend time to build each other up. But if we do all those things without the main thing, then we've missed it all. Jeremy, I'm going to ask you if you'd just come up. and I just, wanna, I just want us to kind of take a few moments to somehow respond. I don't know how that is in your life. I don't know what that looks like for you. Maybe... Maybe your response is just going, you, God, you know what? I, I, I need to open all of me up for you. If you did everything for me, then, then Lord, I want to do everything for you. I want to give you my all. I want to put aside all my complaining. And I want to put aside all my issues I have with this and that. And I want to put aside all my religious things that I've kind of thought was biblical, but it's, you know, I, I want to, I, I don't want to, any bit of Pharisee in me, Lord, take it out, take it out. I just want to be humble, transparent before you. God, if you did everything for me because you loved me, I want to do everything for you because I adore and love you. And so why don't we just end up singing that today as I invite you to stand that we just begin to say, Lord, I adore you. I adore you. And I want, I want to respond to, to your offer to me. You gave everything for me. Because we were broken. This perfection that you created from the beginning was tarnished and broken and abused. And, and then you sent yourself to restore that. And all I have to do is open my heart to you and, and accept. Jesus you mean I don't have to be perfect before I do that you don't have to be perfect because you can't you come as you are imperfect you come as you are with your baggage your past false identities all that stuff you just, you just come as you are heart wide open Jesus I want you. I want you to come in and take that sin that, that's in there. I want to be clean before you. I want that relationship that, God, you've always desired. So I'm going to invite you to stand today as we have a moment with our Lord where we respond. And again, I don't know what that looks like in your life, but... I believe there has to be a response. There's like, there's a yes or there's a no. Could be a maybe. I don't know. But there has to be a response. We tuck this away. That was another good Christmas story. I wonder what next week's going to be about. 
Lord, would we stop seeing Christmas as a story, but as a as a world-changing event that completely, radically changed humanity because God chose to do something different, to send himself. And so why don't we sing together the song that we sang earlier? Let us adore him. I adore you, Lord. I don't have life figured out, but I want a relationship with you. A real relationship. Not one that the, the people of the past, the Old Testament, not this head thing. But I want a heart relationship with you. Where you have my heart. So let's sing this together. And I pray that you respond by opening your heart wide open for him. give you all the glory. to you, Father. It's all about you. Thank you for reminding us, Lord, today through your word, the significance of the birth of your son, Jesus, that you came to us. You took the first step. You didn't make us take that first step, but you took the first step to prove how much you loved us. And now, Lord, we take the second step and respond by by returning our love to you a relationship with our creator the one that created the heavens and the earth who breathed life into us and in this season lord i i pray that we would not get so caught up in the just the chaos all the extra activities that go on during this time Lord, as, as, as nice as they are, Lord, help us not to get caught up in that race so much so that we, we forget it comes and goes. And, and we miss the whole thing, the whole point, the beginning, the start. So Lord, just thank you for reminding us today of that word Emmanuel, God with us, God with us. And it's not even about us that we would deserve your love. But it's about you. That you would actually love us in our sinful state. That you would offer forgiveness to us as we repent of our sin. That you would be faithful and just to forgive us of our sin. So Lord, this season, may we make it a long season not just a season, but a season of lifestyle where we begin this journey with you.
hearts will be changed. And so we make this all about you today, Lord. And I pray over this season, Lord, as our neighbors, our friends, our family that we've been praying for. Lord, I, I pray that the walls would come down. That we would be given opportunity to share you with those who don't know you. In our schools, our offices, the different places that we work, or employed, even our homes. Lord, that this would be a time where we would really understand this good news, this gift is given to us so that we would share it. We would give this gift to those around us. And, and so we pray for receptiveness. We pray, Lord, as invitations go out, that, Lord, you would soften hearts of those that we've been desiring to see know you. And if we've not even lived that way, if we've not desired to share this good news, Lord, may this be the beginning for many of us, most if not all of us, to see the importance of sharing your good news that was meant to be shared with the whole world. And so, Father, we bless you today. We exalt you. We honor you. And we thank you. We thank you. And now, Lord, as we leave this place and are sent out, that we would make a difference because you came to us. It's all about you, Lord. Thank you. Lord, we pray in these, these things in your name, the name of all names, the name of Jesus, our Savior our King. Amen.